Come on, put your hands together for Jesus this morning. Oh, you really believe that he's a beautiful working God this morning? Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Stand with me as we pray to prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful this morning, Lord God, mm, for your grace, Lord, and all of your mercy. For you have the whole world in your hand. And what better hands to have than to have the world in your hands. And so as we come to worship you and to praise you this morning and to give you glory, Lord God, we just want to say thank you for all that you've done and all that you get ready to do. You said in your word to trust in you with all of our hearts and not lean to our own understanding. For all of things work together for the good and are called according to your purpose. And so God, this morning we know that things are working for the good. In the mighty name of Jesus. As you move through and forth through the world this morning, oh God, we ask that you touch families this morning. Those that have been affected by the COVID-19 and those that, Lord God, that are prepared to keep themselves together. We pray, God, your special powers this morning to move in the mighty name of Jesus. Those this morning that are bound, Lord God, to their beds. Those that are incarcerated this morning. Those, Lord oh God, this morning that just need a touch, just need a word this morning for their marriage. Those that need a touch this morning that may not know you, that may not know who you are this morning. Lord God, we're sending prayers to you, for them this morning for their salvation. So, God, as we move through this service, as we worship you with joy, Lord God, we move in a way like never before, as we trust you, Lord God, to do what you say you would do, and as to heal, build, repair, and restore. And so, God, we thank you in advance as we go through this service. Amen. And thank God. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the first for a new Christ Memorial Church. You that are watching on Facebook or different internet uh, uh, websites, we're just happy for you to join in with us. We're working with our skeleton crew today. But these are true worshipers, and I am the pastor of the New Christ Memorial Church. And I want to tell everyone that is watching that we love you and that I'm so proud of all that we are and all that we're going through. And the challenges of this coronavirus that seemingly came out of nowhere, this week has been very hectic. And we, we have a skeleton crew here today, but they're true worshipers. So you that are watching, you're going to hear some powerful worship today. You're going to hear some powerful worship. watching us from all over the world and we're following the directions of our leadership the state and the and our president and they said no more than 25 but we have 25 and a half here this morning <laughs> but it is my heart's desire to worship together with you so we decided to come and some people came in their jeans some people came in their pajamas but they came to worship God now we can't hug like we normally do so just give a little high five a little little this or whatever, but we are worshiping the Lord with our heart. But until further notice, we will be meeting online and this and this way and in smaller groups and smaller congregations to visit our website and find out when we will be back in the Christ Memorial Church. Just follow us on the website. And I'd like to say to all of our seniors that if you need any help with uh, anything, you go to the website of most of you of this congregation, you know my phone number. You know it's 24-7, but not past 11. Uh, that's a good thing. 24-7, but not past 11. Give us a call, and we'll certainly be praying for you. May the Lord bless you and join in with us at the New Praise Memorial Church as we worship the Lord. God bless you.
Oh no! 
every participant in this offering today. We pray for your anointing that you'll bless both the gift and the giver, that you'll multiply it for the ministry, Lord God, for the kingdom work which we do, and then multiply it back to the giver, that they'll have blessings in good measure, crushed down, shaken together, and running over, that the blessings of God overtake them. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.
and he'll never forsake you. He says, Lo, I am with you always. And you know what Psalms 91 says? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely, surely, surely,
If you believe it, come on, it's already been released. Hallelujah. Can we stand? Hallelujah. Amen. It's already been released. Amen. For the Lord. God, we thank you this morning, Lord God, for your presence in this place. God, there's no other place that we'd rather be. And God, we thank you that the Spirit of God is not drawn or encaged by walls, but your online presence, no matter where we are, you are there with us. Now, God, as we prepare to go into your word, Lord God, we pray that you allow us to step behind the curtain of your anointing. <laughs> Hallelujah! And step behind the curtain of your anointing. Lord God, and let your spirit come forth and speak through my lips of clay. And let my pen be of that as a pen in the hand of the crafty writer. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody say, Amen. Amen. While you're standing, grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the 11th verse. A very familiar passage and, and one that many people quote and it gives great hope to many. Jeremiah 29 and 11, and when you get it, just signify it by saying, Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a good sanctified Hallelujah. <laughs> Jeremiah 29 and 11, and this might be a really good verse to mark down, a good verse to write down, a good verse to highlight in your Bible. Underline it, remember it. Memorize it because the Lord really gives us a powerful word right here in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the thoughts, and this is God speaking. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Now I want to read that again from the book, uh, uh, the, the New International Version. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. This morning I would like to speak from the topic, my hope is non-negotiable. Amen. Look at your neighbor before you sit down and say, neighbor, my hope is not negotiable. Not Amen. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, my hope is not negotiable. Amen. You may take your seats. Amen. We're not going to high five this morning, but you can give someone a spiritual high five, a virtual high five. Amen. Amen. My faith or my hope is not negotiable. There was a man that was working as a mime in the park, and he would go out and he would mime, and they would give him little money. Well, simultaneously, there was a zookeeper, and the biggest attraction at the zoo was the gorilla. And one day, the gorilla just dropped dead, and, and the biggest attraction was gone, and the zookeeper said, I gotta figure out how to keep this money coming without everybody knowing that the gorilla was gone. So he happens upon the park, and he sees the mime there, and he says, listen, man, I can show you where you can make more money by doing a little bit of work for me. You come in, I'll give you a gorilla suit. Nobody will be the wiser. You just act the fool out there and do tricks and people are loving you. You'll be bigger crowds than you ever had. So the mind comes into work and he begins to act like a little monkey and he's playing out there and everybody's enjoying him. And, and, and he did so well that, that the man gives him a raise. And he said, whoo, I gotta take this to the next level. So what he begins to do, he climbs up on the edge of the cage and there's a lion next to the lion's cage. And, and the lion would run up to him and he just dangle there and he says, I like this. Well, as it would happen one day, he goes in, he climbs up the cage, the lion is over there, and he decides to dangle over and he dangles just a bit too far. And the man falls slap into the lion's cage. Well, the lion takes off running after him and he takes off running from the lion. Now the people are really intrigued. And he's running and the lion's running. And all of a sudden, man, he gets so afraid, he begins to scream, help, help, help. But at that point, the lion lands on his back, knocks him to the ground, stands on his back and says, man, be quiet. You're going to get both of us fired. Some of y'all catch that three days from now. You're at the end of your rope. It can't go any further. And when you get to the end of your rope, that's when you've got to hold on to hope. Amen? Amen. 
See, sometimes we allow the situations and talking heads and things that are going on to kind of set the tenor and set the tone. Of incest 
the product of molestation, the product of rape, and out of that horrid situation, a baby is conceived, but God will look at you and say, I know the thoughts that I thought about you. Amen. They may not have had the right intention, but as I was knitting you, I was making you in my express image. Woo, glory to God. It blew my mind when I listened to Fred Hammond talk about he was a, a victim of a botched abortion. Mama was going to abort him, but God said, oh no, I, I've been thinking about Fred. <laughs> so you got to abort Fred because Fred has got to bless millions with his praise and worship gift. See, when I designed Fred, I put some instruments in his voice that to make him sing like an angel. When I designed Fred, I put the gift in him to be able to play instruments. I designed Fred on purpose. And when God looked around and said, I got to design Nate. I got to design Elfie. I got to design Suzanne. I got to design Edwin. I got to design. God designed each and every one of you expressly. And God said, yeah, I know what I made that to do. Amen. I know what I made you for. God made you for a purpose, and God made you on purpose. Now, really quickly, I want you to flip over to Matthew 7 and 6. Really quickly, get your fingers moving. Most of you have electronic Bibles now, so you it's really fast. Matthew 7 and 6. Matthew 7. Listen what it says. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet and turn again and rend you. Now I want you to think about the scripture. This one the scripture that boggled my mind as a child. He says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Number one, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet and turn again and render you. Now a dog was not, you know, not lassie in this context. Amen. You know, we love our lassie, we love our Gracie, we, we, we love our little dogs, my little shadow. I, you know what I'm saying? We love and, and those of us are dog lovers. I mean, they're part of the family. We really, really love our dog. But in this context, it's not talking about poochie poo. Amen. It's talking about a mooch pooch. You, know? you ever had a mooch pooch? That's a dog that shows up on your doorstep, doesn't add any value, it just all it does is eat and take from you. Messing your yard, tear up your trash, you don't even know whose dog it is, you running it off. That's the kind of dog it's talking about here. It's a mooch pooch. He said, you do not give that which is holy unto dogs. See, there are some folks that don't understand your value and don't understand the value of the word of God that is in you, don't understand the word of faith and don't have an appetite to take it. And Jesus would say, you don't take that and cast it to the dogs. He said, neither do you cast your pearls before swine. Now listen, the swine only like one thing. They have one thing in mind all the time and that's to eat. So when you throw something into a pig pen, that pig comes and tries to eat it. You take some pearls, they don't see a thing of great value. All they see is something that came in, looked like a pea, looked like an acorn. They're going to chew on it. They don't like it, then they turn and rend you. They come and try to tear you apart. He said, listen, there are people in this world that whenever you cast the most valuable things you have before them, they don't know how to treat it. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't like the appetite of it. See, some folks know that you're telling them the truth. They don't have an appetite for the truth, and that's why they'll try to tear you apart when you tell them the truth. I was in the army and I was dealing, you know, with some brothers there and I always try to make sure I was careful not to take, you know, liberty um, as far as spreading the gospel. I made sure that I was obedient to the, those that rule over me. And we were sitting there one day and one brother asked me some scriptural script, questions. And I said, well, brother, I, I don't think this is the right format. Um, I said, because I have some very strong beliefs and I don't think that you may concur and I don't want there to be a problem in the job. No, 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 just, just tell me. And man, I ranked me by you know, two, three ranks. I said, no, no, so I, 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 don't, I don't think we ought to get into that. No, I want you to tell me. When I began to break down the scripture, he cut that conversation short. And for the next several days, he tried to ruin my career because he did not have an appetite. Even though he had a question, he didn't have an appetite for what God said. See, there are going to be those that are, the, the, the fields are white at the hardest. Those are those that are ready to hear the gospel of those what you want to go and give the gospel to and bring them in. But there comes a time, the Bible said, they would go into certain places and Jesus 
said, if they don't receive you, what do you do? You shake the dust off your feet and you keep on trucking. Amen. You've got to understand, you don't lose hope in sharing the gospel just because people turn it away. You've got to understand that there are those that are going to be dogs and pigs. I'm going to call them people dogs and pigs. But those that do not have an appetite for the things of the gospel. And Jesus said, you don't waste time on those things. Somebody who comes and tries to extract out of you what God put in you, that design that God put in you, that, that word that God put in you, and they try to tear you down at every turn. You've got to understand that you don't let them to set the temperature in your life, for God is your hope, and your hope is not in the ghost. Number two, sell out for hope. Amen. You need to sell out for hope. The Bible says in the book of Matthew that there was a man that went into a, a field. And he's digging around in the field and he found a great treasure. And the Bible said that he sold everything he had, took the money, went back and bought the field. And when he bought the field, he had the right to the treasure. See, the man understood the, the value of the field. Whoever owned the field didn't understand the value of it. All they saw was dirt. But this man said, no, there's treasure there. You know, sometimes several years working for a corporation and could not get promoted. And eventually I got promoted and then sent to California. When I got to California, they were coming to me and said, where have you been? Is there any others like you? What took them so long? You should have been promoted a long time ago. And they began to bless me and increase my wealth and increase my income. Why? Because they saw a value in me that somebody else refused to see. When you sell out for hope, you will give up everything you got. The Bible says the rich young ruler came in Christ and said, I, I fulfilled all of the laws of the Old Testament. Tell me what I need to do to be your disciple. And Jesus says, sell all you have and give the proceeds to the poor and come and follow me. And the Bible said he walked away very sad. See, he was not ready to sell out for hope. Jesus was not interested in his money. Jesus was really interested in him giving him up, excuse me, for him giving up all and follow him as God and God alone. When you look at selling out for hope, what is it that holds you back from selling out for hope? What is it that holds you out from living for God with everything you've got? What are the things that helps you, that keeps you holding on to the things of the world? Jesus said that he desires for us to follow him 100%. Those that put their hand to the plow and turn around, they are not worthy to be his follower. See, when you realize that you have something great, when you look at your field and realize, if I buy this, if I give up all, I know I'm getting more than I'm giving up. That's what the Bible says happens when we give up all to follow Jesus. It follows up and talks about a pearl of great price. And it said there was a man that was seeking to find a great treasure. And when he found this great pearl, amen, he went back and he sold everything and went and bought that pearl. Then he found that thing that he'd been searching for. You may be searching for peace today. You may be searching for happiness. You may be searching for joy. You may be searching for peace of mind. You may be at the end of your rope. And God has said, give up all and follow me and I'll give you what you're seeking for. You see, you know in the Old Testament, the word in the Old Testament for hope is tikvah. And that word tikvah literally means a rope or cord. So hope literally means a rope or cord. Now that is a powerful thing because God had determined that he was going to destroy a city. And when he determined he was going to destroy that city, he sent some spies in it looking and it did just to reconnoiter the land. When they came in and the men of the land desired to kill him. When they desired to kill them, there was a harlot there. That means that was a woman of the night, a woman of ill reproof, too. That was a prostitute. And the Bible says she took the men of God in and she hid them. And the men of God told her, when we come to destroy the city of Jericho, we want you to take a red cord and hang it out your window. And when we see the red cord, we will not destroy your home. Your entire family shall be saved simply because you have the cord. See, whenever you have hope, that's that cord that saved Rahab. Amen. That's that, that, that scarlet cord that hangs out the window that says everything can be destroyed around me, but I won't be destroyed because I have a scarlet cord. I have that hope that is hope is in Jesus. That court represented the fact that Jesus was coming, and Jesus was coming in the lineage of Rahab. It's funny, in the lineage, you never talk about women in lineage in the Old Testament, but there are two women that showed in the lineage of Jesus Christ. One of them was Rahab the harlot, and the other one was Bathsheba. Isn't it interesting that women with great flaws were found and named purposely by the Holy Spirit in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? God made sure that they were called out. Why? Because God had redeemed them. They may have made bad 
choices and bad life decisions, but they have the hope of Jesus Christ coming to deliver them. And when you got Jesus, that's enough. My Lord, that's enough. Amen? Let me leave you with this. You, number three, you let God set your value. Let God set your value. Well, I watched a show called Shark, Shark uh, what's it called, Shark Tank? And in short time, what they do, they will evaluate someone else's business and tell them whether it will, will fail or be successful. And they think it's going to be successful, they invest in it. Well, they, a lot of times they do really, really good, but sometimes they blow it. There's these sisters who went in and they had this, this loud lipstick. And the lipstick were all kinds of colors, green and, and orange and blue and purple. And they told those sisters, that, that's really nice, but you'll never make any money with those crazy colors. But the sisters were not deterred because they didn't allow the shark tank to set their value. They thanked them for the time, but they said, we know we have value in what we do. They went on and began to sell the wares, and it took off, and it became the biggest craze of the last few years. You go to almost any store, women's store, you can find all those colors. I came on one day, my wife had on green lipstick. Then my next day, she had on blue lipstick. They said, you like it? I said, do you like it? <laughs> I've been married while I got smart. I said, do you like it? See, I like it. I said, wear it, baby. Amen. I, you like the green. Do you like it? I like it. You wear it, baby. If it makes you feel good, you wear it. Amen. <laughs> you see, you don't allow someone to set your value. God will set a value on you far higher than anyone could ever set on you. Yeah. I've known brothers that would break down a fine girl by telling her how ugly she was. How nobody would ever want her. You have this beautiful woman standing there, and after years of taking their abuse, she sees herself as something other than what God designed her to be because she let someone else set her value. You have people that will destroy your value because, number one, some devalue you because of ignorance. They don't know any better. Those are those pigs, pig don't know any better. They just run by their appetite. Then you, some devalue you because of prejudice. Those are the dogs. They're prejudiced against you. They mooch in your life, and they just take things from you. And then finally, you have those that develop you because of covetousness. Those are the ones that want what you got, and that's why they take you down. Listen to this story as we begin to close. I was running a consignment shop in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Little consignment shop on a uh, side street, and not many people up there, my wife and I. And so we have people tri trickle in and out. Well, I got this uh, estate, and I filled up my store with this stuff from the estate, and I needed to get it evaluated, and I, and I brought it at an appraiser. The morning we were doing the appraisal, my brother was sitting in the back of the store, just sitting on one of the sofas back there. I brought the appraiser in, I locked the doors, nobody was in there. And he came in and he began to say, oh, that's junk. And that's junk. And oh, that's garbage. And that's not worth anything. He just went through it all. My antiques, he was just devaluing. Well, while I was there, I'm looking and there's like all of these trucks that were parked up on these narrow streets. And I'm like, where are these trucks out here? When I opened up the door, there was a rush of people that came running into the, into the store. So I'm standing there and the line is just full of people. And then my brother looked at me and he called me to the back. He said, man, I've been sitting back here watching. He said, they've been in cahoots. He said, have you seen all the trucks outside? He said, yeah. He said, the antique dealer's friends. He had called his friends and told them that he wanted to value what I have so they can get it at rock, rock bottom prices. So here we are, and we're devaluing all these things of great value. At that minute, I stopped. I kicked everybody out the store. I kicked them all out, and I locked the door. I went to the library, and I went, and, yeah, that, you know, that was when we had like AOL 3.0. I tried to do it on the internet, and the internet wasn't going anywhere, and I wanted to get the valuation before I got over. And I went to the library, and I brought back some books on antique, and began to run through it, and this bowl squad worth $200. This bowl is worth eight hundred dollars. This cup worth six hundred dollars. This stuff the man told me was garbage because they wanted what I had. Everybody said that. Do you realize that the enemy just wants what you have? He will not devalue you because he had an attempt at heaven. Matter of fact, he used to live in heaven, but because he failed, he lost his access to heaven. And now the Lord has given you the keys to heaven. Amen. And the enemy wants what you got. The enemy desires to destroy your very life. And if you will give God an opportunity, God will change your life forever. If you make your hope non-negotiable, 
He said, Lord, I'm holding on. As our pastor is coming, I want you to prepare your hearts for God to do something new in your spirit. For God to strengthen your hope in this time because our hope is non-negotiable. Amen. Thank you.